Welcome to the Archaeology Studio. Today's episode considers theory, method, and technique in archaeology. By the end of this episode, you will be able to define these terms, identify what makes them different from one another, and discuss how they interrelate. You should be able to refer to relevant examples in archaeology. Much of this presentation will involve the philosophy of science in general, but I will present the information in terms of archaeology. To begin, I would like to offer a few brief introductory definitions. You can think of theory as an intellectual explanation of why something exists. An explanation could apply to the formation of geological layers, to the forms and styles of artifacts, or to anything else. A theory could be proposed as a hypothesis that may or may not actually be testable. For example, at this site in Tinian, an arrangement of cobbles once designated an activity area here more than 3,000 years ago. But what would you hypothesize was the specific reason for it? What evidence would you need to find in order to prove or disprove your hypothesis? Method is essentially a bridge between theory and technique. It is a way of linking a theoretical concept or hypothesis with its supporting data. As a procedure, method involves both analysis and interpretation of data. You need to be aware of the possibilities of theories, methods, and techniques before you can develop a methodology most fitting for your goals. At this site in Tumon of Guam, I made choices about the technical excavation procedures in order to supply sufficient material data toward addressing my questions about the use of this ancient beach surface here about 2,000 years ago. Technique refers to the practical procedures for obtaining new primary data or for making original observations about data. An archaeological excavation could involve technical procedures of how to document stratigraphic contexts, how to recover artifacts and other materials from those measured contexts, and how to ensure maximum capture of materials such as through fine mesh sieving. Now with those introductory definitions, I would like to offer more details about the logical thought process in archaeological research, beginning with technique, continuing through method, and then building a case for the role of theory. Archaeologists employ their techniques in order to obtain artifacts and other objects from the past, as well as to record their physical attributes and other data. These techniques supply the raw data sets that potentially could undergo methodological analysis and interpretation. If the initial question is about knowing the presence or absence of a buried archaeological layer in a specific spot, then a small test pit would suffice. The technical excavation procedures can be the same in any size of excavation, small or large, but the specific choices of tools, sitting mesh size, recording forms, field labels, and other practicalities will depend on what research question is being asked. If the research question involves learning more about the artifacts that defined a particular time period, then an excavation can be designed for maximizing the collections. These excavations tend to proceed at a large scale, such as shown here in eastern Taiwan. If the research question involves learning about the formation of geological layers across an entire landscape, then coring or auguring tools can be efficient in recovering profiles of sedimentary columns in numerous representative locations. If the coring or auguring profiles happen to encounter a buried archaeological layer, then you can contextualize it in the geological sequence and potentially organize a targeted excavation project. As you have seen in these examples, techniques always are applied as parts of larger methodologies. 
we can draw on our toolkit of techniques in order to supply the kinds of data that we need in any situation. Techniques apply in the field for obtaining primary data, and they apply in both the field and the laboratory for generating new data sets through new observations. Technical procedures in the laboratory often begin with standard recording of material categories, counts, weights, and measurements. These data sets could be analyzed or interpreted in various ways. Depending on the results, further observations and data gathering procedures could be pursued. As you have seen here, your choice of method depends on how you will use a particular data set toward testing, proving, or disproving a theoretical explanation. Toward this goal, methods can involve both analysis and interpretation of data. Regarding an excavation at Unaibaput in Saipan, I tabulated the numbers of pottery fragments and the weights of shellfish remains for each stratigraphic layer, and then I presented those results in a simple graph. Next, I calculated the density of those materials per liter of excavation in each layer. In this way, I could see more clearly about the intensity of past cultural activities represented in each layer. In order to achieve this result, however, I first had needed to be aware of recording the liters of excavation during the technical operation of the excavation. Furthermore, I recorded my observations of each separate form or style of pottery as a way to trace the change through time in the pottery traditions, in this case spanning more than 3,500 years. As you have seen here, raw data sets are unchangeable facts, but they can be analyzed, interpreted, and represented through variable methods. Now that you have seen how your techniques and methods can be guided by your theoretical questions, I would like to consider more about the role of theory throughout the research process. In one point of view, theory operates in high, medium, and low orders. A high order of theory refers to the abstract intellectual ideas of hypotheses and explanations. A middle order of theory refers to the influence of theory on a method or on a methodological approach. A low order of theory refers to the basic principles and laws of science that allow us to perform our routine technical tasks. One example of a low order of theory is the law of superposition, borrowed from geology. The law of superposition tells us that geological layers are superimposed one over the other. We find older layers buried deeper beneath the ground, and we find the more recent layers closer to the present-day ground surface. This theoretical principle allows archaeologists to perform excavation techniques that treat each stratigraphic layer separately and representing a different unit of time. In another example, we can use the low-order theories about the physical properties of stone materials and about the mechanics of making stone tools. This knowledge allows us to infer how a set of stone flakes originally had been produced. A middle order of theory sometimes is called middle range theory. It has a long tradition in the philosophy of science in general and in archaeology specifically. You can begin to think about middle range theory by looking at the principle of uniformitarianism, telling us that geological laws and principles have always been the same, unchanging and uniform throughout time. Working from this premise, middle range research then asks if uniform laws or principles could exist in other fields outside geology, such as in social or behavioral studies. Many examples of middle range research in archaeology have involved the subfield of ethnoarchaeology, seeking parallels between original cultural behavioral contexts and the material traces that survive in archaeological sites. By observing the way people behave in specific contexts, such as in feasting events, we potentially can identify the material signatures of feasting events in general. 
In this way, we can evaluate whether or not any particular archaeological site was a place of a feasting event in the past. Another example could entail observing what happens throughout the life cycle of a yam growing field. What were the characteristics during different seasons of clearing, planting, harvesting, or fallow periods between crop growths? How can this information help in identifying an archaeological remnant of a yam field? Similar to ethnoarchaeology, the subfield of experimental archaeology aims to find the general laws or principles that were responsible for creating known material archaeological results. Experiments with stone tools can clarify the individual actions, the amount of labor, and the organization of the working people that created different forms and patterns of flaking debris scatters, and other aspects of the stone artifacts that we find in archaeological sites. Other experiments could be performed over long periods of time and accounting for variable conditions, such as considering how differences in soil properties, annual weather cycles, and other factors affected the growth and the usable yields of assorted plant foods. The resulting knowledge can improve our interpretation of how much food was produced per unit of land or for each household or community or village represented in the archaeological record. We furthermore can coordinate this information with other lines of evidence, such as about past climate and weather events during the time when a site was occupied. In this way, we can build more comprehensive understanding and explanations of the past. Concerning a high order of theory, you can consider how theoretical ideas are formulated, what kind of logical reasoning was involved. In some definitions, a theory should be universally applicable as a consistent scientific law. These generalizing theories represent nomothetic reasoning, seeking universal explanation, such as in evolutionary theory or in the theory of relativity. Another form of reasoning can be described as ideographic, referring to a particular case such as in a site-specific context that is not necessarily applicable worldwide in other sites. In regular practice, theory involves both the nomothetic generalizing approach and the ideographic site-specific approach. We need to be aware of the generalizing theories in order to apply them and test them in specific cases. Meanwhile, we need to be aware of what makes each situation unique in order to refine what we think we know of the generalizing principles. As you probably can imagine, the logical thought process linking theory, method, and technique works in a feedback flow. The more we know about our world through our primary data and observations, the better we can explain it. Meanwhile, the better we can explain our world, the more focused we can be in obtaining new primary data and in developing other methodologies most relevant for our theories. New methods and techniques allow us to gather different data sets that we did not know previously, as well as to change our theoretical ideas. Archaeology, like many disciplines, accommodates diverse theoretical approaches and schools of thought. I will not review all of those approaches right now in this episode, but you should be aware that archaeologists use different explanations of why the world exists and operates in the way that it does. These varying viewpoints allow us to study different aspects of the archaeological record. In concluding this episode, now you can define theory, method, and technique in archaeology. You can identify their individual functions, and you can discuss how they interrelate in the logical thought process of research. You should be able to refer to specific relevant examples in archaeology and apply your knowledge in other situations. I hope that you enjoyed this episode, and that you will explore more with the Archaeology Studio.